Good afternoon and welcome to Watercolor Wizardry. Today we are going to be doing a glam goth robe. And welcome to Watercolor Wizardry. Today we are going to be doing a you turn off the volume on my Twitch so I'm not hearing myself talk. Um, so I have a few things to plug today before we get started. Uh, later today at 4 30 p.m. we have episode two of uh uh <laughs> forgetting the name of my own campaign, Misguided Magic. Um and then tomorrow at 6 p.m. we have Chaos Curiosities with guest hosts, uh, Chad and Kat. Thursday at 5 p.m. we have At the Threshold. And Friday at 7 p.m. we have Solemn Exterior. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to quickly read out some of the descriptors for our character. Um, this is for a good friend of mine who's playing in a mini campaign. I offered to do her character art for her. Um, so she's uh, has a, playing like a very pale, uh, almost translucent white, ashen uh, elf with violet eyes and black hair. She's got a glam goth look with a lot of piercings, some leather armor with feather pieces on it, and a black plum and red color scheme. We're going to start with pose, and I had so much fun looking at like goth fashion for this. So she said she seems aloof uh, and intelligent, so I'm kind of going for like a sort of like refined, almost model pose, because I feel like the model vibe is kind of a loop. So first of all, we want to block out top and bottom. Um, if you block out your head height and your foot height, it gives you a good idea of how to how tall to make your character or how big to make your character. And if you're having trouble with that, you can always block it out further. So remember, most people are eight heads high and the bottom of your hips are going to be at about the halfway point. So if I go from here to here, I know that this is going to be about like head to hips. If I want to block it out even further, I can block out this halfway point and then this halfway point and then this quarter point over here is going to be about how big the head is going to be. And one thing that people often make a mistake with when they're drawing is making the head too big and then the body they kind of run out of room for. Um, we're used to seeing cartoon characters and also we focus more on the face. So sometimes when we hyper fixate on certain things, we tend to draw them bigger than they actually are or smaller than they actually are. So keeping your proportions in mind is important. And as much as we look at cartoon characters, Pixar characters, you tend to be six heads high, which is about the height of a nine-year-old. When you're drawing characters that are realistic, if they're not cartoons, you need to keep proportion in mind. So I'm going to go ahead and I know I want to use this pose, but I don't know if I want to use this face. So I'm going to just sort of rough in where the face is going to be. There's like a three quarter face and then a straight on face and I need to decide which one I want. But we want to start by just sort of roughing in. I like to do the rib cage and the pelvic box, but you can also see people as beans. And keeping this in mind, I want to make sure that over here we have the bottom of the hips and then we have the rest of the characters. Uh, space for body length. Okay, so she specifically asked me not to make the character too skinny. So I want to make sure that instead of just drawing the skeleton figure, that's sort of like model sized, I give her a little bit of fat on her body. And I think she also has some muscle. Um, so you just sort of like take the skeleton and then draw out from it. Um, if you know where the muscle placements are, you can pull those out and accentuate them. Uh, but for fat, you just sort of add equally on either side and make sure to keep the curves soft. So since this is a three-quarter character, we're not going to be um, adding the same amount on each side because you can see more on this side. So you just want to make sure that if your character is three-quarters, um, you're going to see less on the side where they're facing away from you. So you want to make sure that you add less on that side in general. Um, if you want to make a character look elegant, you can give them a longer neck. But if the character is a little bit heavier, you don't want that neck to be skinny. So you can elongate it a little bit without making it tiny. And I have like a, I really like the pose on here with the arm. She's sort of keeping her hand to herself, one hand on, well, in this case, the model is wearing a jacket, but her character is going to be wearing a cloak. And you can't really see the fingers. So again, I am making them up. It feels about right. 
Um, might make the head a little larger since the body itself is a little bit larger. And then pulling this out, you want to make sure that you don't go directly into the arm from here. You want to actually draw the shoulder muscle. And if you have a more muscular character, you really want to pay attention to where the deltoid is. Um, the deltoid is the shoulder muscle that connects what's called your trapezius, which comes over here to the cap of your shoulder. And it's the main sort of transition muscle in the arm. You want to make sure there's some overlap and some changes in width. You don't want your character to feel super stiff. If you want to make your character feel more muscular, all you do is emphasize that. Um, and if you want them to be a little heavier, you just give them a thicker upper arm. Usually um, we have fat pads that go, you know, kind of to the elbow and then that start from under the chest and go to the top of the kneecap. So usually um, if you're, unless your character is extremely heavy, the calves to knees um, or calves to feet and then the elbow to fingers aren't really going to change in proportion that much. You just want to thicken the areas in between. And keep in mind that halfway between the hips and the knees is where the tips of your fingers are going to be. So if you want to measure from the hips to the feet, the halfway point over here is where the knees are going to come to. And then the halfway point between the hips and the knees over here is where your fingers are going to come to. So you can kind of figure out how big your character, how long your character's arms are that way. And again, the reference I'm looking at is cut off here. So we're going to be making up the rest of this. I'd like the character to be holding a dagger, but kind of loosely, kind of casually, since the character is sort of like aloof and intelligent, not necessarily violent. So we'll go ahead and do some sort of a blade here. Uh, I think she mentioned the blades a little more specifically, so I'm just going to kind of rough them in. It looks fine for now. And going from the hips outward, usually there's a muscle that pulls up before you get to the kneecap. As soon as her leg is lifted a little bit here, it goes above where the kneecap line is. Um, but then the leg moving down like this, which is moving straight down, is going to move a little bit more like a traditional, uh, where the traditional proportion marks are. I skag water. <laughs> I apologize. I just know you guys by your, your handles. I know I've done art for you, but I keep forgetting who is who. I know Hermes because um, I see a lot of his tweets. Forget which character you are. I did watch your game the other night though. Right. And I'm going to do kind of like a, a delicate sort of like tiptoe rogue pose over here. Um, and then if you are having trouble figuring out where a leg goes, if it's behind another leg, oh, less. <laughs> your character is great. Um, all right. Uh, if you're having trouble figuring out where your character's leg goes, I suggest drawing it out really lightly even if it goes behind the other leg, because you still want to have a decent idea of where the leg is. Now, if your character is balanced and isn't like walking or sort of in a stance that pushes their legs outwards, you can figure out where a character's leg is going to go because the leg that is taking the character's weight will be directly below the head. So if I draw a line directly below the head, I know that the foot is going to be positioned somewhere over here. So all I need to do is There we go. And that's where our character is. I'm going to pull the waist in a little bit, make the character a little curvier. Just want to make sure the chest is the same size so we don't get anything lopsided. Okay, I think that's good for sort of basic layout. 
So let's go ahead and figure out what we want the face to look like. I want to make sure we do that all right. Um, I have a few, I have a three quarter and then I have a straight on view. I'm kind of liking this three quarter view because I, I did find a model with a different face than the body I'm looking at where she's kind of looking down. She feels sort of imperious. Um, if you want it to look like a character is looking down, you need to see some of the bottom of their jaw. So there's going to be like a shadow area down here underneath the chin to make it look like they're tall and they're looking down on you. This is great if you have tall characters too, which this character is. And then about halfway up the face, you wanna mark off where the eyes are. If you're trying to figure out where the hair, nose and mouth placement are, um, the eyes are always the halfway point. And this is only if the character is about level. If the character is angled downwards or upwards, these rules go out the window. But where the eyes are, um, you want to draw a line from the eyes to the chin and then divide that into thirds. One third is going to be where the no bottom of the nose is and one third is going to be where the line of the mouth is. Now, this isn't true for every character because some people have, you know, like a bigger chin, a smaller nose, but it's a general rule. And if you place your proportions here, it won't look wonky. Um, but if you find that your reference looks a little different, then that's probably correct. Um, and then for hairline, usually between halfway between the eyes and the top of the head is the hairline. Um, but our character is looking down at us. We're seeing the bottom of the chin, which means the hairline is tilted away from us. So instead of drawing the hairline here, I'm going to pull it up because we're going to be seeing the hair moving back a little bit. Um, and I know the character has really specific ideas for their hair and piercings on their ears. So I'm just going to give a vague idea there and just kind of draw on the face. I absolutely love these pencil sharpeners. This is a Ducks Albin pencil sharpener. They come in like colored glass. There's, I think, green, gray, blue, and red. And they get your pencils so incredibly sharp. They're great for small details. I think you have her kind of harsh eyebrows. Um, I feel like Glam Goth has very like filled in eyebrows to an extent, as opposed to this character who has natural eyebrows. Make sure you can kind of play around with how far apart your eyes are, but make sure that if the bridge of the nose, for example, if this part of the nose is to come straight back, the eye doesn't begin over here because then it'll look like the eye is moving into the nose, which you do not want. Um, pull back a little bit from that. Generally speaking, uh, the nose can or the eye can be a little far apart or a little farther in if you have close set or wide set eyes, but you need to make sure that horizontal wise they're on the same plane. Otherwise, it's going to look really wonky. I'm giving the character kind of big eyes. We're going to give them a lot of goth makeup so their eyes are going to end up looking a little smaller because of all the black around it, I think. She specified her character as purple eyes. We'll leave a little bit of the iris there. Color in those brows. And she's an elf, so let's give her some, some blush slash cheekbone shadows. Now, if you pull down and continue around the curve of the face, you'll find the ear, and if the character is an, we're looking up at the character a little bit so their ears are going to appear a little bit lower if you're looking down at someone a little bit their ears are going to appear a little bit higher but if we were looking at her straight on the ears would be like right here but we're going to pull them down a little bit since we're looking up at her ever so slightly the ears are going to pull out and you can take wherever the reference for the earlobe is and pull that out too um one sec i need to look at her character sheet real quick because she was very specific about all of these piercings <laughs> She has a number of facial piercings. So 
Oh gosh, one sec. She has a very long description. All right. Okay, a septum ring, which is black. These are all black, so I don't really have to worry about adding color. Um, and I think in the reference she sent me, it was kind of decorated, but this is going to be too small for me to decorate. Um, she can imagine it. And then both ears pierced with three studs and rings, three on the lobe and three on the upper cartilage. Okay, but which ones are studs and which ones are rings? I guess it doesn't matter. Um, okay, so I'm going to give her a pretty big stud here, like to the point where it could be a small gauge. And then we'll do, we'll kind of vary up where the rings versus studs are and the other stuff. I guess it's good that she has big ears because there's a lot of extra room for that. All right. And then I think she has another piercing and a vertical piercing on her eyebrow curve, a vertical piercing. Okay. I think that's where you have the stud above and below because it's, I, I don't know. Tell me if that's wrong, Kat. <laughs> I think that's what it is. I'm not super familiar with the different kinds of facial piercings. And a lower central lip ring. So it's going to be tough because she has black lipstick. But I'll, you know what we'll do? Well, we'll bust out the gold paint for my friend here. So I'm just going to add some water so it has some time to sit. And then we'll pull it out with like a metallic shape later on. Eyebrow is a curved barbell. Oh, wait. So would it come out? Does it does the curve move underneath the eye? Like so would it look like studs or would you actually see the bar? I do know lip. Um, I think that's it. She just said that it's a dagger of returning. I so I, I guess the dagger can look like whatever. We'll just keep it with the color scheme that she has. Maybe we'll give it like a double point or something so it feels extra dangerous. Okay, yes, I think I have it right then. I just have a ball here. Serious expression check. I guess we could lower her eyebrows a little bit, but I want I wanted them to be higher so that we can see the makeup. I think it's fine like this. Her expression can be a little different. <laughs> she sent me a ton of different kind of glam makeup looks and some of them are like kiss level white face paint. And then some of them are just a little bit more normal, but glam. So maybe we'll try and kind of meet the difference. And then she wanted some really specific hair. So let me see. It's got a lot of braids and like curls and stuff. Let's see. It has some long, straight, black hair that is half up with intricate elven style braids, long hair strands that are curled or dangling by the face in front of her ears. Okay, so keeping the hairline a little bit higher because we're farther away from her. Let's... Give her some curled pieces. And then we'll have some, I'm assuming she'll need to be able to see. So we'll pull some up and away from her face since it's half up. And then usually um, 
right here where the eyebrow curves is going to be where the chain, your frontalis and your, oh shoot, what's it called? Uh, not masseter, that's the, I'm forgetting my face muscles, but you also have a muscle here and that's where the plane change in your skull is. And that's where your hair changes shape. So it's gonna come back and then it's gonna come down starting around there. So if this is her hairline, usually you can pull out like a few curves. And then you want to make sure that the hair moves up and above the skull, because if it is flush with the skull, it's just going to look like the character has really flat hair that has zero volume. And you want to make sure that's not the case. Let me pull this out. And she has, hmm, in the reference she sent, she's got like a few Princess Leia braids kind of moving around the top. So we'll pull one braid up and over here, maybe like underneath this area where the hair is gathered. But if her hair is black, we're not going to stand out too much. I guess we could just do like a, a watercolor black as opposed to an ink black for the hair. And then let me look at the other references she sent me for what the hair looks like down. I think it's just like a lot of really long strands. But she has this cool like feather earpiece. So I think I might want to pull it out like this. And for the most part, if you're doing an up close face, you can look up reference for the braids. You wanna add more detail the closer you are. And in general, the face has more detail than most. But if you're doing like bunches of hair, and this is from like a, a longer ways away, you can just do some like bubbly lines and they'll read as braids. You don't have to put any more effort into it than that. We'll just, oh, she's wearing a cloak actually. You're not even gonna see the bottom of her hair. I feel like a lot of characters have these really elaborate costumes and then they're like, and they're wearing a cloak. So you end up covering a lot of stuff. Um, I'm gonna go back and I'm pretty happy with the way the hands look. I'm not gonna spend too much time nitpicking them. So we're gonna go ahead and draw those in a little more firmly. Let me shorten this finger a little bit. Um, and then she's wearing gloves. So let's figure out what we want the bottom of the gloves to look like. Looking at some of this goth costume info, just kind of like for inspo on what some of the shape language is going to look like. And there are a lot of sort of like pointy curved shapes. So let's go ahead and do like some curved pointy gloves. Ooh, you know what? She's got a raven feather theme. I think what we might do is do like, maybe let's have some like, a chain or something here on the gloves and they can end in like maybe some feathered cuffs. I don't know, is that cool or does that feel a little weird? That's how it's gonna be. All right, so we'll pull this in sort of a curve. Um, unless chains are like super, super tight around something, usually they're going to have a little bit more volume and they're going to curve and sort of dangle based on gravity. Um, if you think about diaper folds, which is a fold that has two tension points, the chain is gonna essentially follow that, but without any of the curves that folds usually have. Do you have some reference of feathers kind of like being pushed out of a garment? So I'm gonna follow some of that reference. That works. And then pull some out here. So you've got like some down feathers on the inside that's sort of spilling out is sort of what I'm assuming. And then the longer feathers are just more for decor and they come out the sides, which I, I guess is not especially practical, but I don't know, maybe they're magic. They're magic gloves. So they're gloves of thievery. 
which I'm assuming just give you a sleight of hand bonus. I'm gonna make sure I thicken her wrist a little bit. It's looking a little too thin. All right. And then let's take a look at, she says that she has feather accents. So I found this really cool like feather neck piece that I wanna draw on her that will kind of move into her costume. The only indicator she for costume or color scheme that she has black leather armor. So we'll try and fit everything sort of under this armor. And then I'm going to give her this feather cuff thing on her collar. I was looking at um, like goth uh, chokers, and this came up and it seemed pretty perfect. So I'm going to go ahead and steal that. And let's add. I'm going to do some things to make it our own. Let's add like some, maybe some triangles to make it feel a little bit sharper before we add this other part over here where the feathers are coming out of. And then I want to make sure that we have sort of like the length and um, the composition of how we want these feathers to come out first. Like, I don't know if I want them small, like they are in the collar, if I want them a little bigger. So I want to just kind of play around here and I'm going to do some zigzag lines. Seems about right. I think I might pull up here a little bit and then pull a little farther down on here. Yeah, that'll work. I like the idea of like her having sleeves that kind of branch out like this. So there's skin like in the areas on either side of the collar, but it covers a lot of her chest. So it's not like super scandalous. I don't know. I feel like as opposed to having the character, you know, with like a corset or something or whatever it is. Um, I feel like just in, in general, my own opinion is just when you have like tiny little strange like pockets of skin, it's a much more interesting character design. I feel like it's a little bit sexier. Um, and she didn't give a super detailed description, so I get to have fun with it and kind of do my own thing. Um, I'm going to keep these kind of general because I think I might like to go back in with a micron pen and draw over these in black ink because there's such a black motif here and I want to kind of differentiate the different areas that I want to pull out so it doesn't run together. Uh, FW acrylic ink with a dipping pen can be used as well but I love micron pens because they're felt tip they're easy to draw with and the, a water, the ink is waterproof so you can kind of do whatever you want there. And then I also found these shoulder like things that I'm going to attach to her cloak. Oh, there are a few I picked. That's okay. Um, I'm kind of making this up. It was a cuff that kind of went over here, but since she has a cloak, I want it to attach to um, her chest area instead so that the cloak is still removable, but these things maybe go on top of it. And I do have some silver. for it. I'm just gonna wet that now and give us a time to soften. So that I can put a bunch on it when it comes time for that. So I'm thinking these are like silver metal cuffs. And then coming out of here, we're going to have some silver chains, sort of emphasizing the shape of the deltoid, that's the shoulder muscle, and moving farther down on her arms. emphasize that shape and then coming out of here we're going to give her some more feathers so then you want to pull out the basic shape I immediately like this shape over here for feathers 
I'm not sure about this one. I think it might need to curve a little bit more. So let's just turn that into one big sort of curvy feather. I want to make sure that everything sort of like pushes in and around. Um, I don't want a lot of like flat shapes coming out because it's going to give her a more spiky appearance. But you can have things that end with sort of spiky imagery. And as long as you curve it in, you give it a really defined shape, it's going to feel a little bit more elegant. And I feel like since like aloof and intelligent is more the vibe we're going for, I, I kind of associate that with elegance a little more than I do with just sort of like spiky back off vibes. All right, so coming off of here, I'm going to say this is where her cloak is. And the fastener for her cloak is this piece that moves around the body. And I could have the cloak kind of like billowing out, but I want to keep her sort of compact because I feel like rogues are a little bit more sneaky that way. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And then maybe I'll have her cloak. Move out and over here. And I'm, it's not tattered on the bottom. I think I want it to slowly turn into feathers. Because I know she's got, I'm assuming like a Raven Queen kind of vibe. Um, or Servant of the Raven Queen vibe. So I know she had like a black feather vibe. I want to play with that. So I'm thinking I'm going to fade this to black and keep it more of a silhouette for her. And then just give some feather. Silhouettes here. And that we can pull in with acrylic ink. That works. And we don't need to know what else is inside of it. We can have a flat graphic shape. I want to keep this part a little simpler because we've got a lot of complexity up here already. And I don't want to detract from that by creating a sort of an all over pattern with a ton of ton of intricate detail. So moving back and forth, I'm just going to check out some of the leather armor that I was looking at. I have four or five different kinds that I'm going to sort of combine and play with. Um, and then I'm going to model this off like a, a corset top maybe some metal edging. I don't have reference for it, but just kind of out from memory, I'm trying to pull up some like Lady Sif vibes. I know she's got something kind of like this. I feel like Crescent Moons feel kind of Raven Queenie too, but I don't know, maybe that's not the case. I don't actually know Canon lore super well. Um, Let me take a look. I don't like the armor that like overemphasizes your boob shape. It seems dumb. So I'm going to pull from some other things. Maybe. Hmm. I feel like Glam Goth does have a very corseted look though. So let's pull in maybe like some corset vibes. And kind of pull it in like that. Have it move down. And then not like that, maybe. And then we can give her some sort of like armor plating over here. Maybe we can still give it like a, a feather theme. We can etch some feathers into it. Okay. 
and um, some like fastens over here. It stays in place. And what I'm seeing from the description, everything is black. So we need to kind of rely on like patterning and stuff, which I'll probably add in a little bit later. Usually, of course, it has like stitches here from where whatever boning inserts you have are. So I will keep that. And then I know she has a couple other daggers. So let's give her like a sort of low slung belt. Make it a little wider here, make it more of like a like a sash or something. Um and then have some daggers on here. So we've got I think she has three in total. So we'll put one here and then maybe I don't know, we'll give her like a thigh holster or something. You just want to map out where your daggers are going to be and then figure out which ones are going to overlap where. And I don't think they all need to be the same style. We're going to have some fun kind of playing around with them, making them all feel a little bit different. I think she specified that only one of them was magical, which makes me think that her knives are from all over. Maybe she's collected them from various places. Add a little jewel there to go with sort of the color scheme she's going for. And this one can be a little bit longer. Be a stabby dagger. And let's give this other one. Let's see, we have a swirly one, we have a hooky one. Um, maybe we'll do like a diamond D one. All very technical terms, I know. Don't hurt yourself memorizing them. <laughs> Oh, actually, I think the armor would go over that. So let's pull the armor. I guess she'll like pull that armor flap back in order to draw that dagger. I have no idea how functional this is going to be. Hopefully functional. And I feel like you would want multiple straps to keep your knife in place, right? This is me, of course, not looking at actual reference for this thing. Um, but let's add a couple things to keep it in place. And then there would probably be buckles, right? You should have buckles for the knives. They're strapped on. So for buckles, you just draw a box and then you draw a curved box inside of it. And then you draw a little line just to indicate where the buckle clasp is. And that's all you need. Now it looks like a buckle, then you're done. You can also add the like 
trail from the buckle, but I feel like this character does not have like weird buckle trails coming out. She seems a little more put together. She's kind of giving me like Twilight cleric vibes actually, but whatever. And I would imagine the dagger needs to end before the knee so that you can bend your knee because that's important. Yeah, I've read that too. All right. And then I feel like I'm looking at all of this like glam goth fashion reference and there's a lot of sheer stuff. So underneath her gloves I'm going to give her like some sheer sleeve fabric there we go and then let's check out what we want to do for her legs a lot of the stuff I'm seeing is like tight leggings with like stuff on top of them or just dresses so I think we're just going to give her like, you know, leggings. Maybe we'll give her like some chaps on the inside so she can ride a horse or whatever. Um, but maybe we'll give her some cool boots because goths like their boots. I feel like I want to kind of give her like boots with pointed edges that end almost like their feathers. So I'm looking at some um, foot armor and I'm just taking that as inspo for the boots because it has plating on it. And no one adventures in heels. That's stupid. So everybody gets flat boots. Unless they specify otherwise. And I'm going to pull these out and give her little, little feather details. I've also got some like flat metal motifs on for her. So let's give her like a silver top to these. That's pretty cool. I like that. All right. So all you got to do is you got to add some um, half block folds in the knees to make this look like it's fabric and not just her skin. You add a few indications of spiral folds around the kneecap. Give it a few folds out wherever straps are, wherever things are going to feel kind of tight. And you got to show her the seam for the pants is. And you're good there. They look like leggings now. Congratulations. So we've got our drawing. I'll finish with that. Yes, they were made for goblin stomping. Um, oh, she has played in a campaign before. She played in a campaign with me that her husband ran for a while. That was the really long one. But this is her first time like playing in a new campaign that isn't just us. Um, and she knew her previous character really well, but she was kind of learning the rules. So, all right, I think I don't want gold anymore. I want silver. So I'm going to put the silver. We have some wet silver over here too. Um, 
So let's start by blocking in her skin and then we can put her makeup over it. And I need to pull up some of this makeup reference. There's so much cool goth makeup. I don't know which one to use. I've got this like cool purple one I might use and then just turn some of it black. Cause she has purple. Oh, I need to check her color scheme again. She has black, plum, and red is the color scheme. I'm gonna say that's dark red. All right, so she has super pale complexion. Let's go ahead and just go full on white. Usually we do um, like a white mixed with a little bit of tan, but if she has like a pale, almost translucent expression, we can go white and we can do a tiny bit of gray just to make her look a little ashen. And it's not gonna look like a natural skin color, but that's okay. She's like a pasty goth elf. And it'll make the makeup feel a little more dramatic. If you're going over something with a darker color, you can always paint over that area. You don't have to be super careful. I don't think, oh, you know what? This is translucent. So we're gonna see her, part of her arms over here and over here. All right. I think that's all the skin we're going to see. Oh, and on her chest. All right. And I'm just going to add a little bit of purple. Keep those shadow areas nice and cool. A little bit more bluish purple. It feels a little too much like blush color. So I'm taking a break to do my friend's character today, but next week we're going to start on um, at the threshold characters. All right, I'm gonna add like a tiny, tiny bit of blush, but it's it's not even really pink. So she still looks kind of pasty. Um, and then let's take some of this eyeshadow reference. And I'm gonna pull this like, all the way back here, all the way in here. Taking a wet brush and just kind of fading it out. So it's pulled back. And then I want to pull some underneath the eye. And give her sort of like some, almost like some dark circles, but I want it to feel a little more dramatic than that. And then I want to grab some silver and just sort of lace it over on the inside here so it feels a little sparkly. Um, and then we'll grab some steadily darker purple as we work our way closer in toward the lid. I think that works. That's pretty cool. All right. Um, got to give her some shading too. So I've got to get this glitter off. And I just want to add some shadow shades. In desaturated, like grayish purple, I guess. 
to make sure she feels like there's some sort of light source on her. And then usually there's a shadow underneath the lip. Underneath the chin. And what should we go through and add that? And then I'm going to grab some of this silver. I added way too much water, too. And just sort of start dotting in where some of these piercings are. The studs are a lot easier. Um, you can just dot them in. I oh, need to wait until it's a little more dry first. Yeah, I think you need to wait for it to dry. Um, I do, however, want to block in her lips. Leave just like a little bit of a highlight there, and then let's get her purple eyes. Which I don't know how much that's actually going to show up. No, it's not. It's too dark. Nice. Right, pulling that out. I'm just going to go like super dark blue and red for some of these. Some silver out. I'm going to go purple actually because I know she's got like a purple and red color scheme. Maybe more of a reddish purple. Add that on top of some of the studs, just so it looks like there's a shiny area and a not shiny area. If you just paint things with silver coloring, it's not necessarily going to sh look shiny when you scan it, only when you move it on video. So it helps to like have a couple things. Um. <laughs> yes, it is a dark elf. Um. All right. I think at this point, well, I'm gonna go in and make sure that lip ring really stands out. I think it makes more sense to go on with like white and emphasize the highlight on it. It's hard to do black ring over black lips. There we go. Well, I think that works. Looks like there's something there at least. I hope it reads. Um, and then I'm gonna go in and just darken her eyebrows a little bit. Maybe we'll give her like some purple dye for her eyebrows. There we go. All right, hair is done. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and take, let's see, let's go really small. Let's take a 005 micron pen. And to make sure the braids stay emphasized, instead of going in here with black ink, we're going to go in here with black watercolor, which isn't going to dry as black. And we're gonna first take some black ink from the micron pen, which is waterproof. That's why I recommend using a micron pen over any other felt tip pen. Um, 
because when you go over it it's not going to smudge unless you want that smudge look in which case i you know go for it use high tech c's or something that will smudge but for microns i want this line to stay in here so it's very clear what the shape of her hair slash braids are and i'm going to re-emphasize this by drawing over it and then when i go over it with black watercolor it's not going to dry as black as the micron and so it's going to feel more like this intricate braid that she wanted. You're going to actually be able to see it. Um, and I could pull out areas as well where I want to add some highlights in her hair. But I think the contrast between her pale skin and the hair is a little more important. And I don't want to draw attention with the highlights. I want this to be kind of the main point of contrast. I'm just going to go over this. I guess just to make it even and consistent. I'm going to go ahead and do this side as well. We have a dark elf in the campaign that I run at 4.30 today, actually. Um, but he's a grumpy old grandpa and he doesn't look this hot. but you can still watch him be grumpy and old. Um, that's on Misguided Magic, which starts at 4.30 p.m. Pacific time. Okay. Um, I think that's all we're seeing of the hair. We're gonna go in. I don't know if this is actually black. I think this is actually deep, like desaturated indigo, which I like a little bit better actually. I'm just going to go ahead and add a little water, make sure that this doesn't dry too opaque. You want to see a little bit of transparency when you first lay it on. Um, if you can't see the line art initially, that's completely fine. Usually you can't. Um, and as it dries, you'll start seeing a little more transparency. Just want to make sure none of it touches her face because she's so pale. It's going to look really obvious if I get in there. Well, it's still wet. If you want to tap in more pigment, you can. And I want this area to be particularly dark. So I'm going to go ahead and start tapping in some extra pigment there. Great, there we go. You always want to make sure that when you shade things, um, your watercolor, you have a pretty even amount of pigment on for the entirety of it so that some areas don't feel super transparent, whereas some areas feel like really, really deep and dark. Unless you want that effect for a specific reason. All right. There she is. And I think for the lacing and this decoration over here, um, that's the part I want to do in black ink. So let's go ahead and lay that in because that's going to be tough uh, to pay attention to. And I want to make sure that it dries completely so I can paint in the other things. So this is just going to be completely solid black. Um, so I use FW acrylic ink. I'll lay it out here for anyone who's interested. Um, FW ink is a little bit tougher on your brush. Um, and it dries a little bit more like I don't want to say like globier but it's not as fluid as like calligraphy ink or other ink types that you might buy but I do really like it because again it's acrylic so once you lay it down it's not going to move so I mean don't make any mistakes um but once you lay it down you can go over it you can kind of smudge into it I don't have to be hyper careful about not having like other watercolor touch this because it's going to dry and it's going to stay where it is once it's dried. Um, 
And so you can lay it in as a solid at any time. So with watercolor, you have to work light to dark. So lay in your lights first and then put your darks on top of it. Because if you try and put a, a light over a dark, then it's just going to make the dark bleed and reawaken. So I really like acrylic ink because you can lay stuff in and you don't have to worry about it moving again. But you can lay your darks in before you do your lights and move down to darks. So if you're not sure how many lights or darks you want, you want to kind of lay in some darks for the sake of contrast so that you have a better idea of where to place things. You can use acrylic ink and you don't have to worry about that. And I do have some calligraphy inks for when I want to do other things, but usually that's all like text and calligraphy based. And I don't really use calligraphy ink for painting very much. One nice thing about FW ink is that it comes in pretty much every color. So if you ever wanna just paint with ink, it dries pretty fast, uh, but I think until like midway through college, that was my main medium to paint with. And I really, really loved it. I still do love it. I just don't use it quite as much, um, but it dries quickly and it dries permanently. Uh, but while it's wet, it acts a lot like watercolor. So you can work dark to light with it and you can work essentially how you would with watercolor but it's completely permanent. So it's a lot more forgiving if you're the sort of person who after something dries wants to go over it, wants to change your mind. Um, and the colors are really, really intense and saturated. Whereas watercolor, the more you water things down, like the less saturation there is, it's a much more mild sort of soft looking medium. If you want things that feel very intense and deep, then you can use ink, which is why I use ink for my blacks because it is like the blackest black. Whereas black watercolor, unless you really lay it on thick, which is not really how watercolor is meant to be treated, um, it's not gonna look 100% black. So if you really wanna lay in a color and make it really solid and dark and opaque, use that. You can also use gouache. Gouache makes things look really opaque too. And it's also semi-permanent. but I don't like gouache as much. It ruins your brushes a lot faster and also it has more of a texture to it. And it can smudge your paper if you are painting in a sketchbook like I am and continually open and close it and move it around. But it does look flat and opaque and fun. And it works a little bit more like watercolor actually than this does because you can water it down, you can play around with it and get similar effects, but then it dries uh, acrylic, so. It looks a little more like solid watercolor. It's just this area and then that's the end of the inside of the cloak right so I don't know if, how well you can see on here because I would imagine that some of the contrast um is heightened but now that it's dry I can see some of the braiding through here so when I play with it on Photoshop I can really pull that out and make sure that it's obvious Okay, I think that works. And then I'll just need to make sure that like for the pants and stuff, I don't use this uh, acrylic black, I use something else. Um, but I can pick other things to do in black. I probably just won't use the same black because I want that to feel a little bit more stark. Let's go ahead and you know what I'm gonna do is, cause I wanna see bits of her skin through the lace, but I'm gonna go in with this pasty skin color one more time and block in her skin color underneath the lace, just so that in the gaps, you can see something. And then again, I'm gonna start with micron pen so that this will stand out. I'm gonna go ahead and do the feathers the same way I did the hair. And then everything else will be a little more opaque, but these areas are gonna stand out a little bit more.
Okay. Well, we need to pick a couple areas that we want to be both purple and red. That's the rest of her color scheme. So I want to try and figure out what should be those colors. I'm thinking maybe the strips of armor can be red and then maybe give her some purple leggings or maybe vice versa. I don't know. What do you guys think? I love lace designs, but I am not great at thinking of what they are. So I end up doing just like a bunch of little twirls and swizzles. Just sort of like curves, but you can kind of fake it when it's small. When you get up close, you do really have to study lace patterns and think of like what designs you're using. Um, one thing I really love about working with watercolor as opposed to digitally, uh, which I do do a lot of digital work, but just comparing and contrasting the two is that you're forced to zoom out. You can't zoom in because I know given the opportunity, if I zoomed in, I would be detailing this lace and absolutely nobody would notice. Um, so usually I want to make sure that I stay farther out. I try and avoid like sort of craning my face inwards. Um, and this is the cloak. So I want to make sure that you pull that out, maybe an outline, even if the outside of the cloak is going to be a little bit less dark. Ooh, maybe the outside of the cloak is like purple. That would be kind of cool. Or red. Kind of like in the red. Let's do that. So I'm going to do like a cool sort of purpley red um, so that they match. And keep it kind of dark, but a light wash. At this point, I'm not seeing any wet spots on the top part of the character, so I can go ahead and continue painting. And this chain doesn't have to be specific. I'm just going to kind of wiggle around it and then fill it in later. And people will get the idea. Chains are pretty simple. You don't have to actually, unless you're up close and you really want to detail something, you really don't have to actually articulate all of it. People will get the idea. I'm a big fan of generalizing for stuff like this. Um, if people are just sort of looking for something, you give the indication of it, they'll understand it. A lot of this is about just sort of general pose and vibe than about tiny little details because you're not going to be looking at like, oh, what kind of detailing does the chain have here? No one cares. Um, that's like a big part of art that it took me like a long time to realize. It's like, no one cares. No one cares about the details. They just want to see something cool. Hmm. I think the top of this is going to be black and then it'll be framed with silver and purple maybe. I'm laying in a ton of pigment here. Did not mean to put so much on, but that's okay.
probably if I did a color comp for this beforehand, things would be a little more organized. But I feel like, you know, unless characters have everything custom made to order, it's always going to feel a little eclectic what their outfits are anyway. It doesn't make sense to like really stress out about the color scheme unless someone is paying you quite a lot of money. And for these, no one is paying me any money. So I'm just going to kind of wing it. Okay, I'm kind of loving that. I think it looks really good dark. I'm glad I made that decision. All right, and you can pull some areas out um, just to sort of give a, a discrete sense of light versus dark to things. And if this draws to where I can't see the boning, I'm gonna go over it with a micron pen and kind of show that. Um, Let's go ahead and do this red gloves. So let's do purple pants. We'll do a very dark purple for the pants though. Um, I want the color scheme to still be pretty muted because I don't want, I don't think this is the sort of character whose colors would really like scream out at you. Doesn't seem like a, a neon kind of situation. Go ahead and give maybe some silver outlining around the corset because it's not dry yet. I don't want to paint right next to it. And yay, improv. And when this dries, if we can't see uh, where the one leg ends and the other begins, then we'll need to go back in with like a slightly darker color and emphasize that. But for now, it's completely fine. I'm gonna make sure I go around the blade very carefully. Things are drying too fast. You can of course add water to make them last longer so that you don't get this hard line. What you want to avoid is having a hard line where something dries and then you start in again on it um, to sort of expand the color because it's always going to look like you stopped somewhere because that hard line is pretty permanent. So if at all possible you want to stop things from drying. I'm trying to lift up some color over here so I can see the gap between the legs a little easier. Hello, Lurker. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think that works for the pants. Um, I might go a little bit darker. I kind of liked Scoria, we did like an ombre of like dark to light. I think I might do like a dark to medium one over here, just starting kind of at the knees and slowly working a little darker the farther we go down. Um, and then let's go in with that red again. And do the gloves.
because some areas are wet, you see me going back uh, with a lot of pigment on my brush and just tapping the area. And the dried area is going to, or the drying area is going to sort of self-fill with more pigment so that it dries darker. That way I can go in with a decent amount of brush control when there's less paint um, or water on my brush. And then I can be more exact. And then if I kind of dab the color in after the fact, it's going to dry darker. And of course, it'll take longer to dry, but that's okay. We have a lot of other things we can work on while we wait for it. All right. I want to wait for this to dry before I clarify it. Let's go ahead and, you know, I think I'll keep the armor here black too, but maybe these straps or the, the daggers will be red. We'll go on with a slightly different red because I feel like the daggers are one thing that she probably couldn't control the color of. And if you're working digitally, you can give yourself, you know, like a more ornamental sort of like build out ruby or gem. But in general, when you're doing it, you know, kind of simply, you can just leave a, a white highlight um, in a general curve and it's going to read as something shiny. Here, just leaving like a white gap on the hilt and then gently painting around it. It's just going to read as like a slim, shiny handle. There we go. And then make the sheets about black. I'm doing like pure black ink on one side and then I'm just adding a little bit of water to it. This has a little bit of purple in it, but I just don't think it's going to show through. If it does a little bit, that's okay. And then I'm just going to sort of make an ink wash that will leave it gray on the other side. And there isn't a specific effect I'm trying to get here. Like it's just going to come off as like a gray that's slightly darker on one side, but I'm trying to get a variety of sort of methods that I'm coloring this in. So when you look at it, it doesn't look like someone paint bucketed it with the same like three or four colors. Going back in, I'm just going to take a slightly darker red and emphasize some of these curves over here. The folds on the cape are really visible. Um, let's go ahead and add some like see-through sort of like silvery purple. to this shirt. I'm always paranoid that I'm gonna accidentally smudge something with my hand. The areas where the shirt moves outwards and you're not seeing skin through it, you can make it completely purple. And then the areas on the inside, you just sort of wanna emphasize where the curves are because wherever the fabric overlaps, that sheerness is going to multiply um, and you're gonna start seeing some of the color underneath it. works. And then let's go in with that same method that we did the hair in and we're going to start roughing in the feathers. I don't want to do it over here because her glove is still wet, but we'll do it on the pauldron.
and we'll do it on the bottom of the gloves over here and over there. And we'll do the collar as soon as the gloves dry. So one thing you can do is once these dry, if you really want something that you filled in a solid color to feel like some things are on top or under one another, you can go in with the same color. And because water is a multiplying medium, if you're very careful and you just sort of like outline under slightly underneath where the top feathers are, the top area is, you're definitely going to get um, a little bit of a darker area because the same color is going to be like the same color with the same color stacked on top of it. It's going to get darker the more layers you do. Uh, because it's semi-transparent, not a completely opaque like ink is. Um, but you can also leave it and it'll give it more of a graphic look. And let me go through and just add some purple accents to this armor and let that be nice and saturated and really come in. That can be a bit of a highlight point. When I say highlight point, I don't mean I'm creating a highlight. I just mean like something your eye is drawn to. Your eye is naturally going to be drawn to areas of high contrast. Now that can be high contrast of hue, value, or saturation. Hue is like red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple. So for example, if everything was purple and one thing was, you know, like bright yellow, that's the thing your eye would be drawn to. Saturation is intensity of color versus almost grayscale. So for example, this gem has a lot more saturation and this part of the corset has a lot more saturation. So your eye is going to be drawn to that. And then value. Value is light to dark contrast. And value is the thing that you notice more than anything else. So this is the lightest light. This is the darkest dark. Your eye is going to be drawn over here once this is all filled in. Let's go through and fill some of this area in silver. I'm going to kind of mix that with some white so that it's got a sense of opaqueness to it. It's not 100% transparent. Um, and for watercolor, white can be like opaque or transparent. It depends on the kind you use. I have some shrinky um, opaque watercolor. So it's going to lay in a little more like acrylic than most watercolor, especially since I'm laying it on a little thick. Let me see if I can pull this out and maybe just give it a hint of red to it, especially on the sides. I think that would be kind of cool. And just sort of grabbing some silver over here and over here. Maybe I'll mix these together because one of these seems a lot more solid. I'm going to just sort of dot in the chain. Ooh, oh no, this is not quite dry. This is what happens when you don't wait for it to dry all the way. So I'm, I pulled this up and I'll come back in a bit. But for now, I'll lay some of that right back in. It's fine. If it's still wet, it's fine. You can fix it. If it's dry, then you're kind of screwed. What I mean is like dry on the edges. But if the inside and the area around it is all wet, then you're usually okay. All right. And there's some other areas that I want to do metallic. I'm actually going to mix this with a little bit of gray. So it just feels like sort of a shiny gray. You can definitely do shiny stuff without getting sparkly. Um, in fact, it looks a little more convincing that way, but I feel like for glam goth, sparkly is kind of fun. Um, and I'm liking the look of it. So I'm leaning into that. I 
and the buckles don't have to be like super specific as long as you get an idea of what you're doing. Just outlining this so that people can see where it starts and stops since it's close to her skin color. Um, I'm going to go kind of like a, a darker silver over here before I color things in and then just put lighter silver on the outside. Um, probably add a little bit more red to give like a, a red tilt over here. Maybe some red leather. Oh gosh, there's all this like sparkly pink that's gotten in the red now. That's okay, we can use sparkly red. Let me just grab some grays for the actual blade that's unsheathed. Just realized there should be an empty sheath for that. But you know what? Maybe it's on her right hand side. She's turned. Usually, if I get stuff like this as a commission, um, they'll send me reference. And then I'm a little more careful with how I map things out. Usually, I'll scan the drawing. I'll clean it up. I'll look for any imperfections. Um, and then I flip it horizontally in Photoshop or in Procreate. Just get an idea for if anything is wonky. Um, flipping your drawing can usually help, you know, like make imperfections stand out. So if your face looks a little weird and you can't figure out why, flipping it horizontally is going to make it sort of instantly show uh, what's a little off. Because when you look at it from a different angle, an angle that you're not used to, then things... Uh, that were difficult to see are a little bit more immediate and obvious. But if you don't have Photoshop or Procreate and you don't have any way of flipping your drawing, all you need to do is hold it up um, to a mirror and you'll be able to see it just fine. Um, you can also turn it uh, up, like turn it over so that you're looking at the back of it and then hold it up to a window so that you can see the light through it and you'll be able to see it that way. And check the imperfections. I'm just going in with a pen and just sort of re-emphasizing where some of these piercings are because I feel like it's not super clear for some of them. And the wings. Again, let's do the micron pen. We'll go like semi-dark for those. Don't worry too much about your pencil showing through as long as you didn't like grind the pencil into the paper which don't do that that's going to hurt your wrist long term um usually it's very difficult to tell where the pencil marks are if you keep them kind of light and you do watercolor over them i really like working with just pencil and um some watercolor on top of it i feel like it feels a little more natural i used to add micron pen over everything but I've kind of gotten out of the habit lately and I feel like my art is better for it. Um, because it feels a little bit less graphic and I already tend towards like kind of graphic coloring. Oh, that was not dry. I thought it was dry. I was going to emphasize where those legs are. Here, let's do it over here. I 
It doesn't have to be super obvious. It's okay if she kind of fades into a silhouette. I think she looks pretty good that way. Are there any areas that you want to clean up against this black silhouette? The black will fade into black completely. Black ink. I'm just going to do the bottoms of the shoes over here. The rest of it we'll do with watercolor after it dries. But in the meantime, I think that glove is dry, so we can go in and color the glove. Yeah, we're making pretty good time. I think it'll end up being like a two hour piece, probably opposed to a three hour piece, which means I'm getting faster. Ha. I've also had like a buttload of commissions lately. So I've been kind of in like fast work mode. Although all the commissions are pet portraits. They're very fun to do. Um, I'm working on a horse right now. I usually get dogs, cats, and horses. And then one time I got a turtle and I've gotten tree frogs twice. But most people don't care about immortalizing their pets unless they're a dog, cat, or a horse. Usually dogs. I don't get cats and horses as often, but they are fun to draw. adding some highlights to the blade so it stands out. And go ahead and fill in these feathers. If you have any questions about character art uh, or just watercolor practice in general, feel free to jump in. I'm wondering if maybe I should do some digital pieces in Procreate as well, which I know wouldn't be watercolor, but it might be fun to go over Procreate tools with people. I actually teach a class in Procreate as part of my day job, um, so I'm pretty used to talking about it. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, Procreate is like a $10 version of Photoshop that is an app for your iPad. As long as you have an iPad and an Apple Pencil, it has to be an Apple Pencil, not like an off-brand Apple Pencil, otherwise it doesn't work. Um, then you can basically do whatever Photoshop can do, minus like a few sort of intricate commands. Uh, but if you're just using the basic painting tools, it's like just as good, plus you can carry it around like a sketchbook and draw wherever you want. So. I've basically pretty much switched over from Photoshop to Procreate because it's so much more just like simple and user friendly. And also the base brush set that Procreate comes with is like one of my favorite brush like sets in general, as far as like base stuff goes. Plus it's super, super easy to make your own brushes. So I make a lot of my own brushes in Procreate, um, which you can do in Photoshop. I just feel like in Procreate, it's a little bit faster and easier. Okay. I feel like maybe that's a little too dark. I'm not liking that as much against the hair. So what I'm going to do, and what you can do if you aren't as fan, much of a fan of how dark something is, if it's still kind of wet, you can go over it with water. And then you can go in with a dry brush and pull up some of the color. And notice it's still going to read as black. It's just going to read as like a much lighter black as I pull things up. Look at that. Oh yeah, I can definitely do that cat. 
I highly recommend getting an iPad. Like it is by far one of the best investments I've ever made. I use it pretty much constantly. Well, I use it to teach. So I use it for my work. And then I also use it for my own art. It's just so nice and easy and user-friendly. I have the big one that's like sketchpad sized, but I have a big purse and it's like the perfect size to fit vertically in my purse so I can carry it around with me. But I have, um, I have this size one. I think it's the nine by 12, is it 12 inches? I don't think it's 12 full inches. It's nine by 10. And the nine by 10 screen, it's so amazing. But yeah, you basically just have a sketchbook um, that you can paint in. All right. What color did we say we were going to do this? I think that was going to be black too, right? So let's just draw over that. She's goth. A lot of the things are black. I feel like the color accents are going to be much more subtle. We can use some more of that red leather for the belt though. I feel like I'm trying to think of like if we should do red or purple, but if one of the sheaves is red, maybe she had some extra leather left over, or maybe she bought like a belt set to go with the knife. Ooh, maybe that dagger or sheath like was supposed to go here and they kind of went together and then she just switched them up. So those two are like a matching set, but she deliberately mismatched them. Again, just fill it in as best you can, and then you can always go back and tap more color into it later on. If you want darker color, which I do. You can go in with a dry brush and pull that color up if you decide that you don't like it. All right, let's retry this. I want to go in with this silver. Yeah, this has got to be dry. Yep. And I'm just tapping this in. And it's just going to read as like a random sparkly chain. No detail necessary. If you wanted to look more realistic, you definitely could add more lights and shadows. Um, metallic sheen is, you know, comes from high contrast. So you kind of have to have some dark darks and then like have a really bright metallic sheen to make it look shiny. I'm just adding some like shiny silver on top of the stuff that's dried. I have a really nice like opaque silver on the side. That works. And then while we're waiting for this area to dry, we'll go in with some more of this pseudo black. And tip up these areas. Since the area outside this is already painted, you need to go in with a less wet brush because your watercolor is gonna wanna glom onto and sort of roughen the edge of what you already have painted in. You can get a more exact edge if it's just a, against paper, uh, but if there's already paint on it, it can be tougher to control.
There we go. Um, let's just fill in the boots very quickly. I want this bit at the top to be silver, but the rest of it is just going to be this faux black. Another way of getting black, if you don't actually have black in your palette, is to add equal parts blue, red, and yellow, and you'll get what's called a chromatic black. So blue is really overpowering. It's the most powerful color. If you want to get a true neutral color, like a, a neutral brown, you actually have to add like a tiny bit of blue, a medium amount of red, and a large amount of yellow, because yellow is very easily overwhelmed by other colors. But if you add equal parts of everything, you're going to get something that is overwhelmingly blue, that is darkened by red to create like a deep purple. And then you neutralize that purple by adding its complement, which is yellow. And if you add two complements together, they're going to neutralize each other. So you get like a something very, very close to a deep black using a decent amount of pigment with those colors. Chromatic blacks are often a lot more colorful and they have a lot more depth to them than just a regular black. So if you want a character that is wearing black, but you feel like they're really alive or you know have like a lot of vitality to them, you wanna add like a little bit more color to their, you know, the feel of them, use a chromatic black instead. It's gonna be a really blue based. We're just going to do black or faux black for this as well. I feel like her general aesthetic is like small pops of these dark colors. I, I don't want to get crazy colorful with her. I want it to be mostly pretty dark. And the more colorful we get, the more we're going to detract from the contrast going on with the face. She's so pale. And tapping in extra color where I want it. We're losing some of the dagger over here, but I think that's completely fine. Not really worried about the details pulling out. I think it's fine for them to fade to black as long as the general vibe of the character stays true. I don't want these buckles to really pull out too much either. So I'm gonna find kind of like a deep neutral gray to pull them down, maybe add a little purple to it. I'll give them like a little bit of a highlight, I guess. Just not quite filling in all of the areas with them. And some of it white. And when it's dry, I'll just go over it with a really light uh, gray and it'll kind of mesh together. And I might be able to just do that now. I think it's drying very quickly because I had very little water on here. This is fine. And I'm not trying to make this part look shiny because I don't want to draw a ton of attention to it. So it's fine that I'm just kind of winging it. It's just like a couple of random colors because it's something that's more of a second or third read. All right. And then hilt of these other pieces. Again, let's just keep it kind of neutral. Let's keep it gray. And there are these little stones that we can pull out for them.
going to keep this area gray as well. Don't need to draw a ton of attention to it. Just leaving a few areas bare. Just highlights. And then we'll add like another red gem to this. And at this point, we're pretty much done. I'm just going to wait for some of this to dry and add these silver highlights. So you can probably add them to the glove right now. I think those are all the areas we wanted to add color. I might add a little bit of darkness, some of this, just so it stands out so it doesn't look bright white when I scan it. Also, I feel like a dull silver for the boots makes more sense. I'm going to go through and add some light areas to some of the metal. All right, and there she is. I think we're all done here. So before we end, I do want to just replug everything um, to let everybody know at 4.30 today, we have Misguided Magic, which is, which is the campaign I run. Um, we are in all fam homebrew d and 5e group. Um, it will be our second session. And tomorrow at 6 p.m., we have Chaos Curiosities with guest host Chad and Kat. Thursday at 5 p.m. we have At the Threshold, and Friday at 7 p.m. we have Solemn Exterior. And that's all we got. Here's our glam goth robe. And yeah, that's all we have for the show today. Thanks for everyone who came to watch.